Um, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Emily Bobro. I'm a journalist with The Economist, and we have another fascinating panel. Um, it's always humbling to discover just how bad we are at making decisions, how poorly we know ourselves, and how little we can predict how we're going to behave in the future. Many people have all sorts of laudable goals for how they want to handle their finances. They want to pay off debts, maybe save for a rainy day, but oftentimes what happens when the money is in their hands is they behave just a little less cautiously, a little less the way they, they, they behave a little bit less like the people they want to be. So it's a little bit interesting and certainly a little disconcerting to discover that there are ways to nudge people to behave in the way that they say they want to behave, to make the kinds of choices they say they want to make for themselves. I'm particularly heartened by something called the Refund to Savings Initiative. This is a, a collaboration between uh, Washington University in St. Louis, Duke University, and Intuit. And it's about encouraging more financially insecure people to save their tax refunds. To talk a little bit more about the results of this experiment, it is my great pleasure to introduce some of the architects of the project. Um, our first panelist probably needs no introduction. It's now incredibly fashionable to talk about what idiots we are <laughs> at making decisions, how uh, you know, poorly we know ourselves. And this has a lot to do with Dan Ariely's extensive research into our into, into what makes us predictably irrational, which was the name of the first of several best-selling books. Um, Dan Ariely is now the James B. Duke Professor of Psychology and Behavioral Economics at Duke University, where he is also the founding member of the excellently named Center for Advanced Hindsight. <laughs> <laughs> Michal Grinstein Weiss, is a founder and director of the new Involve Center for Health Behavior Change at Washington University. She is a professor at the university's Brown School um, for Social Work and an associate director at the school's Center for Social Development. Michal has devoted much of her career to rethinking policies for promoting financial security, and a number of her big research projects are about encouraging more people to save. David Williams is basically the chief tax wizard at Intuit, but before he was at Intuit, he was um, you know, doing all sorts of fascinating tax policy work in the public sector, including 14 years as a US Senate staffer and 13 years with the IRS. Um, I wonder if we could start with Dan Ariely to talk a little bit about how your research has informed some of this refund to savings initiative. Sure, so, um, so let me tell you about uh, three pieces of research that we have done in the last uh, a couple of years that will give you kind of a flavor for how behavioral economics uh, fits and uh, informs what, what we do. So uh, the first thing I'll describe has nothing to do with savings, it actually has to do with spending. So imagine you come to a grocery store, and it's a kind of a standard grocery store, and people come for lunch, and they usually buy drink and a sandwich. And there's different drinks you can buy and different sandwiches, so the amount of money varies, but on average, people spend about $6. And, and one day, you get a coupon that says, spend $8 or more and get a dollar off. Well, it's, a nice, it's a nice coupon, but you do get to spend more than you usually would. And the question is, would this coupon affect your, your behavior? Um, but now consider two versions of this coupon. Uh, version one, you get three feet before you enter the store. Version two, you get six feet after you enter the store. So it's not very different, but one of them is before you enter the store and one is after you enter the store. Do you think there would be any difference? Of course, I wouldn't describe it if it was, if it was the same. Um, what happens? The people who get the coupon outside 
of the door are dramatically influenced by it. The people who get the coupon once they've entered the store and had a couple of seconds inside are much less influenced by the coupon. And why is that? It's because this difference of crossing the door is a difference between having a general idea of, hey, I'm going to go and buy something today, and having a very specific idea. The moment people have a very specific idea about what they're going to get, I'm going to get a Coke and this particular sandwich, you can't really change their mind anymore. You really have to get them beforehand. We call this, this process kind of the idea that you have implementation intentions. At some point, you have a general understanding about what you want to to get, and at some point they get consolidated into action plans, and when they get into action plans, it's really very hard to, to move people. By the way, uh, we did a, a bit more bizarre condition. We gave people a coupon outside that said, spend $4 or more, get a dollar off. What happened now? People started spending less. Right? It's a crazy coupon, right? Because you could spend $4 or more, you get, it doesn't really matter, but People kind of use the $4 as an anchor. It's, okay, this is what I'm going to uh, try and spend. By the way, this, this phenomena happened to all kinds of other things. When we asked people to give us their shopping list, uh, before they entered the store, they gave it at very high categories, like I'm going to get a drink or toothpaste or something like that. The moment they entered the door, the category became much more concrete. They said, I'm going to get Coke, I'm going to get a can, I'm going to get uh, whatever brand of toothpaste they wanted to, to get. <clears throat> so. What, what this actually tells us is that the moment that we get people is incredibly crucial, right? That people move from this notion of having general idea, general idea about how we want to behave to having concrete plans, and once they have concrete plans, also, it's a little too late. Uh, not very too late. Um, okay, uh, <clears throat> the second experiment I want to tell you is something we're just exploring now. So we're asking people to come to the lab and to simulate their first day on the job. So they kind of meet the HR people and they uh, have to decide how much they want to put into savings. And some people would tell them that their salary is $35 per hour, and some people would tell them it's $70,000 a year. Uh, it, these are equivalent amounts. Right? Um, when do you think people save more? Is there a difference? When they save more? The $70,000 a year, people, people save more, uh, between 2 and 3% more in 401k, which is a big, a big difference. Now, you could say, well, maybe what happened is that people don't know how to do the math. So let's take the people who uh, make, we tell them to make $35 an hour and say, please tell us how much you think it's per year. And let's take the people who do $70,000 per year and say, how much do you think it's per hour? No. People are wrong, but on average, they're OK with that uh, set up and they get it right and the, the difference don't explain the, the difference. So we said maybe, maybe it's about stability. Maybe the people who get money per hour just think about their job is, is temporary. And maybe the people who make <coughs> 70,000 a year think, oh, this job is going to be with us for a very long time. So we tried that. We gave them contracts that were either $35 an hour but for a really long time <coughs> or 70,000 per year, but the contract is, can, can end <clears throat> at each point. So we had two versions, $35 temporary, $35 long term, $70,000 long term, $70,000 temporary. No, it's not that difference either. Uh, we tried another version in which we said to people, you're making $35, which means 70,000 per year. Even now, it made a difference. It was the first number that people, people had. Um, and then we did another experiment in which we asked people not just to put to say how much money they want to put in 401k, we asked them to separate the amounts into two savings accounts. We said, why don't you tell us how much you want to save in a short-term saving and in a long-term saving. Short-term saving, there was absolutely no difference between the two groups. The, the difference was only in long-term saving. And I think it's, again, it's about the mindset. Right? It's not something that people are thinking kind of thoughtfully, this is a long-term job or a short-term job. The moment people have something that says the word year, they think more long-term and are willing to put more for uh, retirement. Now, the sad thing, of course, is that m almost all low-income jobs are framed on, as an hourly uh, basis, which would uh, be terrible. 
the last thing I'll tell you is an experiment we did uh, also about mindset. In an experiment we carried out in Kenya. Uh, this is an experiment in a slum called Kibera. Uh, this is a, uh, with people who make about, uh, live on about $10 a week, <clears throat> very poor people. And we tried to get those people to save a little bit for rainy day for all the reasons we talked about uh, today. Um, and we, we teamed up with M-Pesa, which is the electronic payment system in Kenya, belonged to Safaricom, and with an investment bank. And the reason we did it is so that people could text money into their M-Pesa account, but every night the money moved from the M-Pesa account to the investment bank, and now it was really hard to get it back. Right? So if you want to get the money back, you had to take a bus, go to the city, submit the form, wait an hour, get the money, take the bus back. We didn't want everything to become an emergency, but we know that emergency happened from time to time. <coughs> so we gave the system to a lot of people. And then some people just got that system and nothing else. Some people got that system, and on top of it, they got the weekly reminder that it would be a good idea to try and save about 100 shillings, about a dollar that week. Some people got the same text message, but as if it came from their kids. Hi, mom. Hi, dad. This is little Johnny, whatever the name of the kid was. Uh, Try to save 100 shillings uh, this week. Uh, by the way, there was no deception. These, these people knew that uh, the kids don't have cell phones. <laughs> and uh, they knew that the message didn't really come from their kids. Another group of people got a 10% match. At the end of the week, save up to 100 shillings. We'll match it up to 10%. Another group got a 20% match. Two other groups also got 10% and 20% match, but they got what we call pre-match. What's pre-match? There's a, there's a principle in behavioral economics called loss aversion, right? That people hate losing more than they enjoy gaining. We said, what if we deposit the money, the 100 shillings, in, the 10 or the 20 shillings into the account in the beginning of the week, and we said, if you save 100 shillings, you get to keep it. You save 50, you get to keep half of it. You don't save anything, we take it all back. And then the last group got a coin about this size, and we, we etched the numbers of the weeks, 24 weeks for the program, on the edges of it. We asked them to put the coin somewhere in their hut, and we asked them every week to take the coin and take a knife and scratch the number for that week, and scratch it one way if they saved and a different way if they didn't save. And think about all of those methods and try to figure out which one you predict people would save the most. So we could, we could take a vote, but try to, to think to yourself which one you think people saved, saved the most. Um, we've also done a study on asking people <coughs> to predict the, the results. Um, and I can tell you when, when a large sample of people predict the results, they think that the 20% pre-match will be the most effective, and they think uh, the kids and the coin will be the least effective. But what actually happens? What actually happens? Um, just giving the system to people with nothing else creates a little bit of savings. Already good, right? Just making it a little <coughs> hard to get the money back. Um, adding a weekly reminder helps substantially. Adding 10% at the end of the week helps a bit more. 20% at the end of the week, just like the 10%. 10% in the beginning of the week helps some more. 20% in the beginning of the week, again, just like the 10%. Right? So loss aversion works, but 10 or 20% don't matter. By the way, people think that 10 or 20% will make a big difference, but it doesn't. It's not about the financial incentives. Kids, by the way, were indistinguishable from the 10, 20% uh, with loss aversion. Um, and then the coin was the big surprise because it increased savings dramatically above everything else. And of course, the question is, is why was the coin so, uh, so successful? As Emily mentioned, our research center is called the Center for Advanced Hindsight. And <laughs> we, use, we use the name also to remind ourselves that it's very easy to see a result and say, oh, I knew that all along. But we need to remember all the cases in which we thought we knew uh, we had a different prediction. Right? So, um, so what happened? Uh, so the coin was the most successful, and when you look at the days of the week, um, everybody saved on Thursday, which is the day that we send people the text message. And the coin was slightly higher on Thursday than the other conditions. But where the coin really got its benefit was all the other days of the week. 
In all the other days of the week, in the no coin condition, people save nothing. In the coin condition, they save from time to time. And again, this is all about mindset. Bless you. This is all about mindset. Um, imagine that you have kind of a universe of things that you could be thinking about. Are you thinking about all of them? Of course not. You think about a subset of them. Which subset? Whatever comes to mind. Uh, what is it that in your environment reminds you about savings? Nothing. Right? And if you live in Kibera, certainly nothing in your environment reminds you about savings. If anything, everything reminds you about spending. All of a sudden, we had something in people's environment that from time to time reminded them about savings. They thought about it from time to time and uh, took some action. Now, if you think about all of those uh, results, if you think about the question about the supermarket and uh, mindset, you think about money per hour versus per year, you think about the coin, these are all very delicate effects, right? They're all basically effects about are we catching people at the right moment? Are we catching people at the right mindset? Can we create the right mindset? Can we create, uh, can we do it at the right moment in the right mindset? And hopefully with those ideas, we can get people to behave differently. Final words. That's good. So this was it. Final. Well, that's simultaneously disheartening and <laughs> encouraging. It's good to know that these are things that we can correct for even if it's a shame that we constantly make these bad decisions. Um, Michal, I wonder, or David, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, David, why don't, why don't you walk us through some of this project and, 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 how, and how these lessons are being put to action? Uh, OK. Uh, however, I want to start with a quiz, um, just because you haven't had one in a while would be my guess. How many people in the audience took microeconomics at some point in your life? And I would say that's a majority. Now, do you, it may have changed, because when I took it, it was a long, long time ago. Um, you remember the concept of, at the time, forgive me, it was the rational man? And right, everything was about at the margin, what would people do? And you could see the indifference curves. And people behaved in this amazingly rational way, um, which we all had to learn and study. It was a prerequisite for graduating. And, um, now you've learned it's crap, right? <laughs> Not completely crap, but I think even as we did, I still recall the time thinking, who really thinks that way? And do I need to start thinking that way? Um, and I'm in a course that's teaching me how to think that way. Um, and the reality of the matter is that people do not behave rationally all the time. And in fact, um, as a matter of course, we have built public policies in this country that make assumptions about how people should behave. And we build programs and we administer them based on how that works. Um, and and what, what I love about refunded savings, and I will talk about some of the details in a moment. You'll get the big details. I'll just cover the, the fun stuff. Um, is that we've really recognized that while we have outcomes that we want, we want people to save, to plan, to be ready for their financial lives, um, the methods that we've used so far have not gotten us where we want to be. And so we need to break out of that box. And it's what I love about what Dan's talking about. And, and it's why my company and why I personally believe so much in the notion of that moment, that in this case, the tax time moment, as a way of leveraging someone's intellectual bandwidth, if you will, the, <clears throat> the cognitive ability to actually think about their futures and things that we, th we think are important. And when, when I say we, policymakers think are important. Um, and with that context, let me talk a little bit about refunded savings because it specifically focuses on that tax time moment as a way of, of leveraging that instant when someone is actually thinking about money coming in uh, and maybe they've actually looked, gotten at least a broader sense of their finances as a way of uh, encouraging folks to save. Um, and that was the question that we began with as a team, which was how can we build financial security, specifically savings, uh, for families, and how can we do it away in a way that's scalable? Um, and I, I want to emphasize scalable. We talked a, a bit about VITA today, which is an incredibly important program. Our company has supported it for years. Uh, I worked on it when I worked at the IRS. Um, but I would submit it is very difficult to scale VITA. Uh, and you heard, I don't know where she is, if she's still here, but uh, our, our colleague from New York talk about the amazing work they're doing to try and drive and build VITA 
uh, but it still is hard to reach all of those people. And that's in a place like New York, where there's an active government trying to drive the program. Um, I worried when I worked at the IRS about folks in rural areas who didn't have access to those kinds of resources. So scalable and scalability matters a lot to me. Um, McCall brought this incredible background and expertise in asset building for low-income families. Um, Dan joined and really brought his background, and you can see his thinking about how people actually behave and how we can drive and change behavior. And our company um, basically brought its insights and the platform. And our platform, um, just to be clear, we, we build a product called TurboTax, which is a do-it-yourself tax software product, which reaches roughly 30 million people, families, file through that product. Many people don't know that we also have a tax pro product that files roughly the same amount, 25 to 30 million returns come through the tax pro product. And so we look at both of those as opportunities to think about leverage to encourage people to save, and particularly in the TurboTax product. And we spend a lot of time on in insights. So the notion of refund of savings is what can we do in the tax experience to trigger people's thoughts and get them to save money? Very, very simple. Um, big or small, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. But with that, we've done this uh, work for several years and tried to innovate around things like the anchoring that Dan was talking about. Um, other, there are social proofing. There are lots of ways one can use behavioral economics, and we've done some experiments with them. I'm going to let McCall go into the details. Let me just talk at a high level, and with apologies to David Letterman, um, our top 10 list, right? Because you haven't had one of those in a while, because he's off the air. Um, so these are the 10 things that we learned, and I'll, I'll cover them relatively quickly, but just give you a sense of some of the insights that we've gotten through the work so far, and to express a little bit of excitement about the work that is coming, particularly in partnership with Treasury around a new product called MyRA, which we'll, I'm sure you will hear more about from our next speaker. Uh, so top 10, we'll start with 10. One, the population that we were looking at was far more financially vulnerable than we realized. Um, I think most people in this room would know that, but when you talk about outside, folks are like, I, I, I don't get it. But you hear various stats about the ability to get your hands on $2,000, $500, whatever it is in case of an emergency. The bottom line is a lot of people in this country shockingly don't. And we can sit in this room, um, what did Clinton call it, the ceiling audience? Was that what we are, the ceiling audience? Um, and we may well be, but the reality is that many folks uh, who we are really looking at trying to influence do not have the financial capability that we thought they did even a little bit. Also, and we also heard this today, uh, low and moderate income households are very volatile. Um, their incomes are volatile. And, volatile. and we, we saw uh, really a graphic demonstration of that. I would add and submit uh, that it's not only income that's volatile, it's family uh, composition that's volatile. For those of you who know how the earned income credit is structured, you know that there are particular rules about when a qualifying child can be claimed, and that also applies for a variety of other federal tax benefits. Um, the assumption in the tax code is that people have sort of stable financial lives and stable families. Well, that just doesn't happen to be the case. You'll hear more about that from me um, at another venue at another time, but I think what we've learned is being able to predict all that is really tough. Um, I'm going, uh, unsecured debt but not secure debt is associated with lower savings rates. Who knew? That one's pretty obvious. I think um, anchoring works really well. So the notion of saying, would you like to save 75%, uh, works very well in prompting people to save. And a corollary to that um, is that higher numbers actually work quite well. So not a bad, bad thing to do. Um, most people who save say they save for emergencies. So that notion of why are you putting money away? Well, we, many of us might say, well, it's for our financial futures. Uh, particularly in this population, we are looking at folks who are saying, I'm saving because something bad's going to happen. I don't know what it is, but I need to be ready for it. Um, this is one that's important, and it's a learning that we had as a company, and, and I think it's insightful, which is if people open their emails, and that's an if, because we don't get high email, email rates, um, they are more susceptible to savings interventions. So it's a self-selection, obviously. You see the email, they open. They are more open to actually the prompts and other things that we can do to prime them, if you will, to make that savings decision. Um, <clears throat> believe it or not, we found that people do save portions of their refund, not, as, not in gigantic amounts and not in numbers that, that perhaps might, be, uh, might resonate in this room, but as a, a bottom line message, refund to savings works, and we found ways to make it work. 
uh, and it resulted in a lot of savings with very low touches. And I want to I want I want to just talk about that for a second. Um, you know, a prompt in software, or with a person, may not seem like a lot. It's not a heavy lift for us. It does matter when we build it because it, it is about how we provide service to our customers. But if a minor change in wording can generate a million dollars in savings, maybe folks won't think a million dollars is a lot, but you know, two words equals a million dollars, that's a lot of leverage if you really think about how we can get people to, to save. And, and frankly, I don't think that we're going to solve the savings crisis or problem that we're talking about just through what we're doing, but it, this is one component that I think can contribute to our overall solution. Um, and lastly, and I think this is actually critically important, some of the behaviors about saving that we are able to generate persist after tax time. And you're going to hear from McCall how that happens. The bottom line is that some of it is persistent, which I think is another goal. We want people to continue to save, uh, and so we've been able to show that that's possible using the behavioral economics principles and the design that McCall and her team put together for us. So with that, let me Thank turn it over so to you. Thank you so much. Well, I'm sorry, Emily, I just know there's a presentation coming. <laughs> okay, thank you. So I'm a professor, I will stand and will use a PowerPoint for my presentation. So, what? Okay. So, I will continue talking with you about, you know, what we have done, what we have learned from 2015. I will build on what Dan Ariely say and Dave Williams and go to our kind of high level and early le learning from the 2015 year. But because we're starting with quizzes, and because I know there are many people here who are either running tax time program, doing research on tax time, or thinking about policies, you know, encouraging people to save at tax time, I'm just curious, how many of you have already filed your own taxes? Please stand up. Wow. <laughs> Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> you know, wow. <laughs> we need to see you guys, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so while there are still two months left into the tax season, at this time, last, month, last year, already half of the out west participants filed their taxes. So two months left and already more than half of them were done. So why is it? Because tax time is a really important financial moment, right? And that's why we are all here today, and what, that's why we are talking about it. And here is some number to kind of you know, suggest that it's really important financial moment. But it is especially important for low-income people. So again, looking at our data and what we have learned from this initiative, last year, in 2013, we have found that the average um, refund was equivalent to 2.5 months of housing for our people and also to 1.3 months of income, the average refund. So many, you know, such an important and large uh, component of their um, earnings. And this is why we started the, the Refund to Saving Initiative, and as Dave already mentioned, and then, you know, we are trying to test behavioral economics. We're using the platform of the free file, um, the free file platform, and that allows us to have access to very large scale of people, so we're doing our intervention every year with about half million households, so we're very fortunate in that, in that way to be able to, to have a really rigorous testing, and we use like randomized control trial, and we're really trying to do to learn how we can develop low cost and low touch and scalable saving interventions. And to be eligible uh, to participate in the Free File Alliance, um, there are several eligibility criteria that you can see here in red. People have to earn you know, less than $31,000 a year or qualified to EATC or be on the military. It's a little bit hard to read, so I'll just tell you. So as you can expect, you know, how our participants are having very, very low incomes. They are relatively young, but they do have a relatively high federal tax return because of the qualification for ITC and other. So what we have done, what we have done this year, what we are doing to try to encourage them to save. Uh, in 2015, we really built on one of major behavioral economics component, choice architecture, right? Choice architecture is described as people trying to engineer choices to impact people behavior in the most uh, predictable way. So we all familiar with the aisle of the grocery store, right? We are faced there with many temptations. Candy for our stomach and candy for our brain. 
who married whom in Mexico, right? But what if instead we'll put some more, um, we'll have the better, healthier choice of uh, food or more intellectual readings, for example. <laughs> So this is, we have built on this technique in our intervention in 2015. We took these techniques of choice architecture, of changing the choices to try to encourage more savings. So, and it's also we're intervening in the golden moment. So we intervene when people are finished filing their taxes and they're getting to this point when they need to decide what they do with your money. And it's a golden moment because we say the money is, is yours but not quite in your head. So that's when we intervene. They get, participants get to this end of the finishing file, they're getting the screen that say how you would like to get your refund. And usually what they see and what control group have seen in 2015 is just a simple, three simple options. Do you want to direct deposit into your bank account or get a paper check or split your refund? There is no strong saving emphasis, right? But what we have done for our treatment group is we have changed that, we engineered this screen to start with two very strong saving options. One saying, would you like to save your entire refund into a saving account, and that's kind of the first option. And the second, would you like to save part of your refund into a saving account? So this is what we did in terms of changing the presentation of the, of the choices on the screen. We also introduced motivational prompt. We also for, we had like three different treatment groups, and for each one we use a different prompt. One we're talking about emergencies, the other one we're talking about retirement, and the last one we're talking about future. So the final screen looks something like that. This is an example of one of the intervention group looking on future orientation. You can see that in the red is the prompt that people are getting, encouraging to save for future goals, and there is some interactive pro prompt on the side, but there is also, they are also getting this choice architecture, the new engineer, a screen for us. So what we have learned? We have learned that just by changing this, just by you know, this simple change to the screen, we are able to really statistically significant, but also in a very meaningful way, increase how much people deposit into saving accounts. So you see here a little bit more than 5% increase in how much people in the treatment group deposit into a saving account compared to the control group, and that's true across all the different uh, interventions, all the different treatment groups. And that's also true for the amount of how much they save. So the same result we see in substantial and meaningful statistically significant increase on how much they save. And here you see on average how much to save, but people who were, were able to get to save more usually save their entire refund, so they save $2,000 more. Here is just include also people who didn't save, so there's zeros you know, in what led to these statistics, but the impact is quite uh, substantial. We compared to our control group, the treatment group had 51 increase in the number of filers who deposit into savings, and 46% increase in the average amount that deposit into savings. Now, imagine you received a large sum of money, like 1.3 times of what you make in a typical month. How long it will take us to convince you to save part of this money? The people in the intervention group spend only three to four seconds, let me emphasize, seconds more than the people in the control group where they decided where to put their money. So it's just a matter of seconds when you can engineer you know, people to spend more, you know, spend more into a saving account. And that's translate to a really large impact again, as Dave said, this year we even saw, seen a bigger impact than previous year. This year we found that we were able with the RTS intervention in, uh, generate uh, twen over 21,000 more new savers. And that translate to 35.6 million of new savings that we wouldn't have seen without the RTS intervention. So in conclusion, I only had like a very short of time, so I'll just kind of share with you the high, high, high level, but uh, from this kind of high level result, we see that choice architecture seems to be very powerful. We found a substantial increase in the rate of savings and how much people have saved, the amount saved. Emergency prompt seems to be the most effective, although the other prompts were also effective, and we do know that people in this population face with many, many emergencies. And we find that low 
cost low touch intervention work. So what next for us? We also part of the refund to saving initiative um, invest a lot of time in developing this household financial survey. We administrative a uh, household survey a uh, very long um, at the end, like very detailed at the end of the at the end of when they're filling their taxes, and it includes like a deep look on balance sheet, household, you know, uh, assets and debt, and what how people want to save and what is you know retirement saving and use of government um, in programs, etc. It's it's very detailed, and we had um, at the end of the tax season we had uh, almost 24,000 households filling this survey. And we did a six months follow up with uh, um, 8,840 participants that completed that and will be analyzing this data now. Um, we also, and as you will hear uh, from Melissa really soon, uh, we have worked this year on trying to test how we can get people at tax time uh, use the MIRA to use, how we can use behavioral economics to get people at tax time open a MIRA. And Melissa will. A Cody, a remark shortly after me, after this panel, we'll talk a little bit more about the old treasury work with, regarding to my array. And we also are testing right now in the field new interventions, which will be our 2016 intervention. So with that, I want to acknowledge all our partners and go back to my seat and open it to, back to Emily. Actually, can I? I want to make one comment about the, the time difference. Uh, the, the control condition and the experimental condition also had different amount of text uh, on them. And you would expect people to take more time. Uh, the fact that people take so little time uh, doing TurboTax to start with and how little time was added in the experimental condition, I think, should get us to, to, to rethink the kind of interventions we have. So in, in no way do I want to say that doing your taxes in TurboTax is not completely fun and exciting and, and <laughs> emotional. People just want to stay, to stay doing it for longer. Um, but, but it does seem that people are, are rushing through the, the process. Um, and and maybe, maybe it's not the right time for interventions where people have to read more or, or think more carefully, right? Because it, it is the, one of the important things about choice architecture is you want to engineer your intervention to the type of attention, mindset, and so on. And, and I think for me, this, is, this has been such an interesting, surprising data that I, I think would inform our, our future interventions to be more mindless and less uh, thoughtful. Mindful. <laughs> so let me just respond to that. I, uh, so uh, we've made a business out of reducing cognitive burden, right? That's, that's essentially, I don't know how many of you have ever tried to use TurboTax, but the notion of reducing the friction, the mental friction that one has to go through to complete one's taxes is something that has built an, an amazing business. And so this notion of adding a couple of seconds actually matters a lot to us. Um, and it has to be the right couple of seconds and it has to appeal to people. But it also affects millions of people at once. Um, and whether it's in TurboTax or whether it's applied more broadly to, you heard a discussion about apps and technology earlier. This is not just a tax time application. It is the way of the future for people who are engaging electronically. And so it may seem almost trivial that you've just added a couple of seconds. I don't know that they're rushing through it. The amount of burden it takes to answer a question to which they know the answer is substantially lower than, mm -hmm. oh, I have to go look that up, or I have to count that, or I have to get the right rule to make the answer. Um, and that's what makes this so powerful. Just minor tweaks can result in, in, in significant behavioral changes. Anyway. Thank you so much, uh, all three of you. Um, once again, it's discouraging to discover just how much the architecture of our, of our choices informs our decisions, but it is encouraging that there are folks like you actually ensuring that we make decisions that we're proud of. Um, it seems like we probably have some questions now for our panel. Um, now seems like a good time to open it up to the floor. Can I, can I, can I just mention one, one more thing is, so you know, we're trying to use choice architecture for good. Uh, sadly, there's some terrible examples uh, out there of people using it for bad. Mm. Uh, maybe the worst one is a company called Wonga. I don't know if any of you know it's, this company. They're, they're not allowed to, they're, they're a payday lender. They're not allowed to work in the US because they have higher rates than our own payday 
payday lending, so they're that bad. But bad. what they do, which is, in, in, I, I admire their creativity and I hate the, you know, the business model, <laughs> but, but it's, it's an iPhone app in which you ask for money. And you have two sliders. How much money do you want and for how long do you want it? And what they've learned is that people who push the sliders all the way to the right very quickly are really bad credit risk. So they just, just give them the money. Right? But if you think about this as, as an idea, it, it basically says that we can track people's thinking process in the online environment in a way that could tell us something about people's, people's intentions. So they're, they're using it for evil, but I think there, are, there might be some interesting ways to, to think about this. <clears throat> Uh, David Martzall with Center for Economic <laughs> Progress. Um, simple question, but I'm really interested between Mikhail and yourself and David. At what point does this experiment, and we're now two or three years into it, become universalized within TurboTax, and what are the limitations uh, in doing that? And maybe that's a David question to ask. Oh, but you can, you can tell him what to do, right? But I'd just be curious, because of that 30 million people, that's a huge number of people to move the scale needle from where you've started. Uh, so it's a great question. Um, there are a couple things I'd say. One is we haven't really nailed down. We continue to look for ways to be more effective at this. Uh, and so that is part of what's coming next. I think the real focus for us, and you're going to hear about this from Melissa, so I don't want to steal too much of her conversation, is um, can we actually trigger folks to use savings vehicles that are, um, I, well, I won't say ideal, but I would say MyRA is a pretty impressive product for those of you who aren't aware, but you might, you'll hear more about it. Um, but <clears throat> the, the, the challenge we have now is that uh, in the last several years, we've incorporated choices about what one can do with one's refund. So we've added, uh, where's Tim? We've added, at the behest of Fred Goldberg and a whole coalition of people that uh, leads us to Doorway to Dreams, we've added the ability to split a refund. Um, we've also added the ability to save U.S. savings bonds. It turns out the take-up rates on those are um, remarkably low, unfortunately. Um, and so the question that we're actually now starting to explore is, with the right savings vehicle or with a savings vehicle or set of them, can we actually move people, not from just saying they're going to save, but to a vehicle that actually... Uh, has some of the features of having to drive to another village and, and wait an hour in line, but perhaps at least creates a framework and, a, and, a, and an architecture that includes a savings vehicle that isn't a cash account. Um, and so that, for us, is the next frontier. Um, you can imagine, uh, for the financial folks in the room, um, their interest in opening you know, financial savings products of their own, but we are focused on ways in which we can help stimulate that. So more to come. Um, I'm not sure when we will scale it, but I think when we have, uh, I don't believe there's a silver bullet, but when we have something that we think is ready to scale across, just, not just us, but across industry, I think that's when we're going to pull that trigger. Yeah, I, there's, there's another interesting thing is that when in the TurboTax process have we passed the right mindset? So, so if you use TurboTax, you know that it keeps on telling you how much money you should expect. And, and the question is, that at what point do people basically say, okay, this is the money I'm expecting and I already have plans for it? So, so we've, been, we've been talking about when is the right time to do it, and right, right now it's at the refund uh, step, but <clears throat> should, we, should we do it much earlier, right? Should we do it first thing when you go into uh, TurboTax, or at least uh, get people to think about savings all around, or you have this little counter on the side that says how much money you're expected to have as a refund. Should we start by having from the beginning, this is how much money you have going to savings and to uh, Mm. To, 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 as a refund all, all along. There's lots of ways to try and make this intervention, I think, more powerful, and, and we're trying to work on some of those. Oh, um, Morning Star is Hello Wallet Division. Uh, I wanted to ask if you'd given any thought to the feasibility of reducing people's refunds uh, by getting them to withhold uh, less money in subsequent years and then doing an intervention at that point. Uh, because it seems to me that the, you know, the large refund might just be too much of a temptation for people, uh, but if they uh, increase their paychecks uh, by withholding less, by better aligning their withholdings with their actual tax burden, uh, and then redirected that money uh, to Myra or another kind of savings account, um, that might be a good form of pre-commitment. Um, I know that's you know, more difficult for the EIC population than people who, you know, because of the refundable nature of it, but 
Uh, I was just wondering if you'd given any thought to those kind of interventions. So, so, so it's interesting, when, when we started working with Intuit, there was lots of engineers at Intuit that were trying to get people to have zero refund. They thought this is the right answer. And people basically resist, resist very strongly uh, this refund. Actually, when in the, f the first year when we did the household survey, even before we did anything at TurboTax, we just asked as a survey questions. People, particularly low-income individuals, really wanted self-control mechanisms. They really wanted something out of their hands. Now, does it have to go to the government? Can it go in some other ways? I think it can go some other ways. We just don't have this mechanism yet. But if anything, I think we should, until we have a good mechanism that people could deduct money and can't approach, I think we should increase um, uh, okay. deductions so that people have uh, more money at the, at the end of the year. Let me make just two comments about that. Um, <clears throat> one, uh, I won't have a quiz this time, but I'm willing to bet that a substantially large number of people in this room are hoping they'll get at least a refund. I mean, in this room, with all of you who've had microeconomics and I'm guessing some finance, you still want a little bit of a refund. And that is behavior we saw at the IRS all the time. More specifically, um, the earned income tax credit used to offer an advance feature. Now, there's a debate about um, and in fact, I was just at a conference with David and others uh, about what, how you could resurrect that because it was killed several years ago. Um, and I, I would tell you, having looked at that for a long period of time, there were a number of administrative problems with it, not the least of which was that the, the burden of administering it went on the employer. But psychologically, <coughs> virtually all of the people who, who might have been eligible resisted because of things we've just talked about. Volatility of income and volatility of family structure, meaning uncertainty about the outcomes. And so I think, uh, to Dan's point, unsurprising that large numbers of people, particularly at the low income, said, I want, I want to know that I'm getting a refund. And so um, I think that's probably not where we're going to go immediately. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. I think that that uh, brings our panel to a close. Uh, but I want to thank. I want to thank Dan Ariely, David Williams, and Michal Grinstein Weiss. Um, thank you so much for walking us through uh, refund to savings and for informing us of ways to compensate for the ways that were predictably irrational, I guess. Thank you very much. Thank you.